One of the fastest growing white collar crimes in many Western countries, including our own, is identity fraud. Identity fraud usually involves someone either stealing an existing person's identity or the creation of a fictitious identity. How does this happen? Well, perhaps someone steals your purse. Perhaps someone steals your wallet. And as they steal that precious personal item, they, they, they take your driver's license. They take your bank cards. They, they take your credit cards. Or maybe they go to your letterbox and they steal uh, some of your mail. Or even they go to find where your rubbish is and they steal your rubbish. They, they take personal details, things that list personal matters out of your rubbish. Or maybe, as I know it's happened for some in the congregation, you, you respond to fake emails and in responding to fake emails you innocently give away private details. Well, however it is that they get these things, though, with those personal details about you, your name, your date of birth, maybe your bank account numbers and so on, they can pretend that they are you. And in the sense, in that, it's in that sense that they steal your identity for the purpose, of course, that they can steal your money. Now, this is a massive problem today. In 2006, identity fraud cost, in America, $15.6 billion. That's in one year. That averages out to nearly $1,900 it cost every American person in that year. Identity fraud. In 2001, in Australia, identity fraud costs in excess of $4 billion. You try and do the sums. I didn't get my calculator out, but we don't have anywhere near the number of people America does. What that costs us as individual citizens in this country, identity fraud. In the UK, a, a fraudulent transaction takes place every eight seconds. Now, all of this fraudulent activity boils down to the question about people's real identity. They are not who they say they are. So the next time you ring your bank, the next time you ring your insurance company or so on, don't get offended <laughs> when they ask you for your address, when they ask you for your date of birth, when they ask you for some password or some particular number that's your own private information. Don't get offended when they ask you that, when they're asking for the proof of your identity. They want to know whether you are who you say you are. Well, friends, as we return to our studies in Mark's Gospel today, we come to what I've entitled a question about identity. You see, if the Pharisees and scribes lived in our day, and of course they don't, but if they did and if they used our modern terminology, they would have wanted to have Jesus of Nazareth charged with identity fraud because they did not believe Jesus was who he said he was. And in the passage that lies before us this morning, I believe Jesus proves from the Old Testament scriptures the true identity of the Messiah, which in effect was proving his true identity. Now, it's been a number of weeks since we were in Mark's Gospel together, so I just want to remind you briefly about what we've seen. Remember, wave after wave of attacks that Jesus had had hurled at him while he's in the temple... Remember on the Sunday, Jesus came into Jerusalem triumphantly riding on the donkey. Late on that Sunday afternoon, he goes into the temple, he looks around, he views the scene and then he leaves the city. And then on the Monday, he returns to Jerusalem and there's the whole scene about the fig tree. He comes to Jerusalem, he cleanses the temple, he drives the people out who were buying and selling in the temple. And when he comes back to the temple on the Tuesday morning... 
the chief priests, scribes and elders came up to him and remember, they raised a question about his authority. And then after that, the Pharisees and Herodians had a question and their question was about responsibility. That is, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And then the, the Sadducees had their go. They had a question about eternity, about the whole issue of the resurrection. And the last time we were together in Mark's Gospel some weeks ago, we saw one of the scribes coming. And, and there there was a question about priority. Jesus answering that question about which was the first, which was the greatest of all the commandments. Now on each of those occasions where questions were thrown and fired at Jesus, Jesus silenced his enemy. He answered their questions Remember those questions which they thought would trip him up and they wanted to expose his real identity? This Jesus, they wanted him to be shown before the crowd there in the temple to be a fraud. So they're bringing these questions which were tricky, difficult questions which they thought would expose him for being a fake. But each attempt was in vain. Jesus answered each of their questions honestly and I would say brilliantly. So much so that Mark tells us at the end of verse 34 in Mark 12, but after that no one dared question him. Now what Mark records for us is that Jesus turns now to the religious leaders and he raised a question himself about identity. Jesus wants to hone in on the true identity of the Messiah. They've been asking all these questions to him, so now he turns to them and asks a question. Actually, within this one question, there are three questions. So let's deal with them one at a time this morning. And to get the, the, the fuller picture, we need to turn to Matthew's account first. As we see in the first place, the first question. Matthew chapter 22, please. The parallel passage. It's also found in Luke, but there's a couple of things here in Matthew that we need to observe this morning as well as Mark. So Matthew 22, we're thinking of the first question. It's not in Mark, it's in Matthew. Verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together... Okay, just think of the scene. There's all these questions that have been coming and going from all the different types of religious leaders and the enemies of Jesus there in the temple on the Tuesday morning and here are the Pharisees. They've probably heard each of the answers Jesus has given. They've been floored by how, how brilliantly Jesus has, has responded to their so-called tricky questions. The Pharisees regroup. Perhaps they're trying to work out, okay, now what are we going to do? And before they can leave that scene... Jesus turns to them with the question. Now, here it is, verse 42. Saying to them, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? So here's the focus. His question's right up there, right up there front. What is your understanding about Messiah? What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Is he? Now, in some ways, we could say that that question was almost an insult for the Pharisees to answer. It would probably be a little bit like you going to ask a, a maths question, and you go to the to the university where there's a mathematics department and you knock on the door, you find the lecturer, the professor in mathematics, the head of the department. He's got a PhD. He's a doctor of mathematics. You knock on his door and you're asking the question, excuse me, sir, what is one plus one? Well, <laughs> could you imagine his response? It's like, well, it's, it's two, of course. Notice the Pharisee's answer. Back in Matthew. Whose son is he? They said to him, the son 
of David. Now the New King James and many of your translations perhaps will do the same puts in italics the words the son. In other words those words are not in the original they've been put in the English translation for us to understand for it to make sense. It's come from one language to another. So literally what's their answer? Whose son is he? Of David. Of David. Everyone in Israel knows the answer to that question. The Messiah will come from the family of David. You see, the Jews recalled God's promise to David, what's sometimes called the Davidic covenant. And part of the Davidic covenant, as it's recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God said to David, before David dies, God says, I will set up your seed, David, after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. All the way from David, right through to Christ, there was this messianic hope. The Messiah would come from the family of David. He would come from David's body. From the loins of David would the Messiah come. So we read in Psalm 132 and verse 11, The Lord has sworn, the Lord has promised, the Lord has given this oath, he has sworn in truth to David and he will not turn from it. So God has made this promise, he is committed to do this, he will not back away from this. What is it, what did he say? I will set upon your throne the fruit of your body. In Jeremiah's day, God said in Jeremiah 23 and verse 5, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, and I will raise to David a branch of righteousness, a king shall reign and prosper and execute justice and righteousness in the earth. Everyone knew that when the Messiah comes, he will be born into the family of David. It was known in, the, in those days straight after David got the covenant, he heard the words, it was known through the times of, of after, the kings that followed after David, it was known through the prophet times, all the way through, there's this expectation Messiah will be born into David's family. No wonder Matthew was very careful how he starts his gospel and who he says Jesus comes from in his family. So why were the Pharisees so touchy? This is such an obvious question and answer. Well, perhaps it was that they were well aware of what the people were beginning to think and some were beginning to say when it came to this Jesus and hence when they had this question, they're on edge. Back in Matthew chapter 12, on one occasion, after Jesus had healed a demon-possessed boy who was blind and mute, The multitude that observed that miracle and saw what Jesus did and saw his evident power, that multitude started to ask the question. They at least started to ask the question and the question was, could this be the son of David? They're starting to think, oh, look what we're seeing. Could he be the son of David? Some weeks back, In our studies in Mark, in Mark chapter 10, that last paragraph, remember Bartimaeus? We heard blind Bartimaeus, remember, calling out to Jesus as Bartimaeus sat by the road begging there outside Jericho. And what did Bartimaeus say? Son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd, what did they do? Shh! They tried to keep him quiet and the more they said, be quiet, Bartimaeus, the louder he cried, son of David, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy. Those words of Bartimaeus were most likely spoken only the week prior to this Tuesday of Jesus in the temple. Now it's Tuesday morning probably, certainly Tuesday, it's probably the morning in the temple. Perhaps the Pharisees could still hear ringing in their ears the voices of the people who only two days earlier on the Sunday ran out of Jerusalem as others were coming with Jesus as he 
was heading towards Jerusalem and what were they singing? Jesus is on the donkey. Remember the palm branches? What are they singing? Hosanna to the son of David. Two days ago. It's Tuesday. But on the Monday, the previous day, after Jesus had cleansed the temple, we made reference to this in passing some weeks ago, Matthew tells us in Matthew 21 and verse 15, this verse, when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. What are the children doing? Well, the children are still singing the chorus on the Monday that everyone was singing on the Sunday. What's the chorus? Jesus is the son of David. Jesus is the son of David. You see, in many ways, the question that Jesus asked was a hot question because of the context. And perhaps we can understand why the Pharisees were so short and so uncomfortable with this question. Because this first question was taking them to the heart of the identity of Jesus. We come back now to chapter 12 in Mark and consider with me the second question which we find Mark records. Verse 35. Then Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now here, and perhaps you can see the cross-reference in your own Bible, that Jesus is quoting directly from Psalm 110, and in particular, it's verse 1. So let's turn back to Psalm 110, and we'll read more than just verse 1. Psalm 110. Start reading at verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers or they shall be made willing in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. We'll stop there. Here we have the promise of the coming Messiah. He will reign. He will be a king. But you'll notice there in verse 4 that he will also be a priest. He will not just be a temporary priest. He will be a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now I didn't read it but did you notice the heading at the top of the psalm? It's actually like verse 1 in the Hebrew. It's not put that way in the English. This is a psalm of David. So rightly does Jesus say that David said these words. But as we come back to Mark chapter 12 and listen to how Jesus introduces this, Jesus also acknowledges that these words of David are inspired. David wrote Psalm 110 by divine inspiration. We know that from what Jesus says in verse 36 at the start. But David himself said, by the Holy Spirit. David said it. The man David said it, but he said it by the Holy Spirit. So there's a sense in which what Jesus does here in a very succinct way is he outlines the nature of the Holy Scriptures. And this is another sermon in itself, the identity of the Scriptures, the nature of the Scriptures. 
You see, it is at one and the same time that the Scriptures are the word of men, men like Moses, men like David, men like Paul, men like Peter. But whilst it is that, and it is that, but it's also the very word of God. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, Peter writes in his epistle. So there's no question of what David said in Psalm 110 is true because he said it by the Holy Spirit. So what Jesus is putting before them is fact. This is true. This is the word of God. It's God's own words, though they are also David's words. Interestingly, this very verse that Jesus is quoting, Psalm 110 verse 1, is the most quoted Old Testament passage found in the New Testament. That's significant. Surely it tells us that this is a fairly important verse in New Testament understanding. So what did David say here in this verse? The Lord said to my Lord. Okay. <laughs> What's going on here? The Lord said to my Lord. Look closely. Look closely at the words. Notice the difference between the first Lord and the second Lord. The first Lord is in capitals, which is a way that the translators indicate the different Hebrew word for God. So what's this? It's saying the Lord, that is Yahweh, said to Adonai. Adonai's Hebrew word, my sovereign, my, my master, my Lord. Yahweh said to Adonai, capitals, Lord, Yahweh, said to small letters, Lord, Adonai. Well, what does David mean here? Well, we're thinking about the question, how is it that the scribes, Jesus says, how is it that the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David when David says this, Yahweh said to Adonai, the Lord said to my Lord. And now, as we try and get our head around what's he saying, think of who it is who's saying it. David. Well, I thought David was the Lord of Israel. I thought he was the ultimate sovereign in Israel. David's the king, and in that sense it's a rightful use of the word Adonai, that he ultimately is the master in Israel. So how can David have an Adonai when David is an Adonai? He's the sovereign of the land. So what does this mean? Who is this Lord in this verse that Yahweh, we identify him, Yahweh, capitals, that's the Lord, God Almighty, who is the one that Yahweh is speaking to? Who is the Lord in the smaller letters? Who is Adonai? Well, this sovereign, this Adonai, according to the verse, let's find help in the verse itself, is going to sit at Yahweh's right hand. And it's at the right hand of Yahweh, which is the place of power and dominion and authority, the place of honour. And what else does the verse say? But there in that place, he will remain in that position of dominion until every one of his enemies are conquered. This reference to footstool. What's that? <laughs> All these puzzling questions about this little verse. Which, by the way, the Pharisees didn't understand. The reference to footstool or under your feet is a very graphic image. It's taken from the days of battle warfare where the conquering general displays his victory over his enemies. There's actually a scene in the Bible in Joshua of this literally happening when Israel defeated the five kings of the Amorites. In Joshua chapter 10, we read the story. And we won't read all the story. Time will not allow us to read the story. You can perhaps do that some other time. Great story to read for the children. But listen, verse 24 of Joshua 10 says, So it was... 
when they brought those kings to Joshua and Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said to the captains of the men of war who went with him, come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. And they drew near and put their feet on their necks, literally. The defeated enemy, five Amorite kings, lying in the dust before the victors. The conqueror's feet literally placed on the necks of those kings. Those who are conquered are in complete submission to the conquerors. David says, Yahweh said to Adonai, all your enemies will be under your feet. You will trample all your enemies under your feet, Adonai. You will sit on that throne of dominion and your enemies will form your footstool. Adonai, you will go forth conquering and to conquer. So who is this one that David speaks about? This one that Yahweh is recorded to speak to. Who will sit at the right hand of God? Who will conquer all his enemies? Well, we know the answer. We've already seen in the psalm. It's a messianic psalm. It's speaking about the Messiah. It's speaking about Jesus Christ. So here Jesus puts this scripture before the Pharisees there in the context of the temple all the crowd are around him he's there teaching them they've been bringing their questions he's answered their questions all the people are there he now turns to them he asks this question this is the second part of this question he puts before them a scripture in which David himself says by the spirit that Messiah is Adonai his Lord David understood that Messiah is his Lord. He understood that Messiah will reign on the throne, that he would be a king and that he would have absolute power and authority and that there would come a day that everyone will bow before him, all his enemies under his feet. That's the very one that David himself says by the Holy Spirit. The words of Jesus. David himself said by the Holy Spirit, this one is his Lord. Yahweh said to my Lord. Here's the second question. Well, what answer will the scribes give to this? They say that Messiah is David's son. Well, what's their explanation to this scripture? Which takes us directly into the third question now, found in verse 37 of Mark 12. Therefore, based upon that text of scripture, that fact Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? How can Messiah be David's Lord when you say Messiah will be David's son? These are the very words of David. And I want you to notice the emphasis in both Verse 36 and verse 37 in the words of Jesus, the emphasis is repeated. David himself said this. So Jesus could say, I'm not even saying this. I'm just pointing you to the scriptures. These are David's own words. David himself said this and David said this by the Spirit. David calls Messiah his Lord. Now they had a problem because in many ways all their thinking of Messiah was bound up in their first answer. God has promised that Messiah will be a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Yes, David would have a son and he would be like a conquering king but he would also be a priest. And his priesthood was according to the order of Melchizedek. Not Aaron, but Melchizedek. Hebrews picks this up. Without genealogy, 
having neither beginning of days nor end of life, the eternal one, a priest forever. Messiah will come to do the great work of redemption. He will deal with sin. That's what priests do. He will be making an atonement for his people. Messiah is the great king of all kings. He's even above Israel's greatest king, David. He is David's sovereign. David himself said that the Messiah, David's son, is also David's Lord and God. Now here, of course, Jesus is opening up this verse to show that Messiah will be both human and divine. He will be born into David's family whilst at the same time he will also be Adonai. He will be God in the flesh. And yet even before he comes into this world he and takes on that human flesh, he exists, eternally begotten of the Father. And the day would come in time, somewhere there, after David receives that initial promise through the Davidic covenant, the day would come as Luke records when the Holy Spirit would overshadow Mary and Messiah would be conceived in her womb. Not two persons in one nature, but the mystery of one person in two natures. The God-man, human and divine. Not ceasing to be what he always has been, God, while starting to be what he had never been before, but what he will always be, man. God. Man. One person. Romans chapter 1 verses 3 and puts these things, if you like, neatly together side by side. And it says, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You see, the question of identity is settled. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is both the son of David and David's Lord. Well, what then is the response in the temple to these things? Well, Mark gives us part of the answer and Matthew gives us something else. Let's look at firstly what it says in Mark at the end of verse 37. And the common people heard him Gladly. I don't quite understand why it's translated that way in this translation, the common people. There must be a reason. I don't know what it is because literally it is the large crowd heard him gladly. There was a large crowd gathered in what was probably the outer courts of the temple which was a massive area, some say as large as 25 acres so possibly thousands of people are around Jesus. He's teaching in the temple. And when they heard these things from Jesus, according to Mark, they listened with eagerness. The people heard him gladly. And yet, friends, the tragedy of that description or the frightening thing about that description at the end of verse 37 is that many of these very people had only two days before greeted Jesus, Hosanna to the son of David. They hear now with their own ears in the presence of Jesus, they hear about the son of David being David's Lord and they listen to those things that Jesus says, they hear them gladly. But within two and a half days, many of these very people would cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Do you see how frightening that is? That you could even hear these things this morning. Listen gladly even. 
but ultimately you would never embrace Jesus as your saviour, this one who you'd like to hear about. You've been gladly hearing him, but ultimately reject him and you perish in your sins. That's why I say that's a frightening statement. May that not be your response today. What about the response of the Pharisees? Well, let's turn back to Matthew, chapter 22. Verse 46. Jesus has asked his questions. If David then, verse 45, if David then calls him Lord, how is he then his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. That question primarily was directed at those Pharisees who had gathered together. And yet it was for the benefit of all. Jesus in the process of instruction. But in particular as we think of the Pharisees, no one was able to answer him a word. Jesus raises these questions and they have nothing to say. He's asked them questions and they can't give one word by way of an answer. What could they say? Would they dare to say that Psalm 110 is not inspired? Would they dare to say that David never wrote Psalm 110? <laughs> they wouldn't dare say that in front of all those people. They had two possibilities. They could humble themselves. They could humbly confess their ignorance about who Messiah is and say, look, we really don't understand all this. And they could have then asked Jesus, look, Jesus, would you be our teacher? You obviously understand more of the Bible than we do. Please teach us. They could have bowed at the feet of Jesus and they could have confessed him to be not just David's Lord but their Lord could have done that or not being able to answer him not being able to refute what he is raising before them walk away and continue in their sin and tragically their feet took them in that direction <coughs> They walked away with their closed minds, with their blind ignorance and their proud hearts and their feet took them on the path which led them in a few days to actually kill the long-awaited son of David, David's Lord. Rather than bow at the feet of Jesus, they did all they could to get rid of Jesus. And yet these very men will one day join all the enemies of Christ and they will be under the feet of Jesus for all eternity. You see, friends, the ultimate question that comes to us today from this passage relates to your position regarding Jesus' feet. Where are you in relation to Jesus' feet? The promise in the scripture is abundantly clear. All enemies will be subdued under Jesus' feet. No exception. Since today is the day of salvation, his arms of love are open wide that you might come to him in humble, repentant faith that you might come to the feet of Jesus and ask him to forgive you of your sins, bowing before his royal authority in your life. Where are you in relation to Jesus' feet? You see, if today you remain unbending and unrepentant, make no mistake about it, there is a day coming when you will be under these feet 
all of us will be found at Jesus' feet. Either as his followers, subdued by his love and grace, or his enemies, subdued by his holy justice and infinite power. May all of us bow with hearts of submission and hearts of love in our lives now, before the day comes when all of his enemies will become his footstool. It seems to me the words of this wonderful psalm are a fitting preparation for the Lord's people before we come to the Lord's table this morning. It's a wonderful verse. Effectively, Psalm 110 and verse 1 was God allowing David to see via prophetic foresight a post-resurrection conversation between God the Father and God the Son. That's what it is. David's given insight down the corridors of time for, by, by, by a thousand years roughly and he hears the conversation after Jesus has died and resurrected. He hears the conversation between God the Father and God the Son. There when the Father welcomes Jesus back, he's been crucified, he's risen, that Son is risen from the dead and he's placed at the right hand of the Father in that place of power. On this Tuesday in the temple, Jesus knew what lay before him within the next few days. He knew that he wasn't some helpless victim. He's the triumphant messianic king. He goes to Gethsemane. He goes to Calvary to conquer and to conquer. It's at Calvary he defeats the enemy of sin. It's at Calvary he defeats the enemy of Satan and of death. He goes triumphantly to lay down his life to secure the redemption for an innumerable number of sinners. And then on the third day, He rises from the dead triumphantly for our justification. And then 40 days after that, he ascends on high. All his glory. Yet the way he gets to the crown is via the cross. The way to the crown is via the cross. When the victory is accomplished, that victory through the cross, through the tomb, he'll be welcomed back into glory. He'll sit at his Father's right hand side and there he will ever live to make intercession for his people. And he will continue to reign in that place of power and majesty, administering justice and righteousness until all the enemies of the people of God are destroyed. And the way to the crown is via the cross. His powerful feet must first be pierced. His feet must take him to Calvary. Thomas Kelly got it wonderfully right in his song. Stricken, smitten and afflicted. See him dying on the knee. Tis the Christ by man rejected. Yes, my soul, tis he, tis he. Tis the long expected prophet. David's son, yet David's Lord. By his son God now has spoken. Tis the true and faithful word. Let's pray.